The PIC32 that we use does not have a DAC, a digital to analog converter, but it does have the opposite, an ADC or analog to digital converter. That means that you can make voltages using sensors and read them into the PIC as digital numbers to interpret them and then do something like a control system or a data recorder. So we'll talk about analog input, which is chapter 10 in our textbook. Um, there are lots of different types of ADCs, but for our PIC32, we specifically have a 10-bit analog to digital converter. That means that when we take an analog vol voltage and turn it into a digital number inside of the PIC, uh, we do that by saving the number as 10 bits or to the 10 different values so that we get the range of 0 to 1023. That's a 10-bit number. We'll probably store those into an unsigned short or a 16-bit number because that's the, um, the smallest bit range that we can use to store this number. So in the short, some of the bits won't be used. So it's not quite efficient. You can find other ADCs that are 16-bit, um, but they have, you know, in, in different picks or different chips. Um, we just don't have it on our specific pick. So how do you read an analog voltage? Well, first you have to generate it, um, and you can set it from 0 to 3.3 volts. That's the range that uh, the pins on our pick can read. Um, you can actually adjust the maximum voltage so you can get a higher resolution, uh, but the default method is to use the full range of the power supply of the pick. So when we read zero volts, we'll read the number zero. When we read 3.3 volts, it will be converted to the number 1023, and it's linear in between. So that means that the resolution that the pick has is something like 3.3 divided by 1,000, around 3.3 millivolts of resolution. The pins that are capable of reading the analog to digital converter are called AN, ANX. There are 16 of them, and they happen to all be on the B port for this specific uh, pick 32 so b0 is an0 and b1 is an1 all of the b pins can read the analog to digital converter uh, note that the b pins on the pick are not 5 volt tolerant for this reason if you apply more than 3.3 volts or less than 0 volts to any of these pins you could burn out the adc converter on your pick or burn out the entire pick so as always check to make sure that your pin is capable of reading 5 volts before applying 5 volts to it so how do you take an analog voltage and convert it into a number? It's a two-step process uh, called sample and convert. And this is probably one of the more complicated peripherals on the PIC. There are lots of special function registers to set and many different modes that the ADC can operate under. Let's talk about the most simple version of that, uh, manual sampling and manual conversion. Uh, so we've got our pins, the B pins and we can have B0 to B15, so there's 16 different pins. But there's only, well, okay, there's two analog to digital converters inside of the pick. But let's simplify things for a second and just say there's one. So somehow we have to be able to take the voltage from our pin to apply it to the ADC. How does that happen? It happens through a section of the chip called a multiplexer or MUX. This is a digital switch that, well, we're controlling it digitally, but can pass an analog voltage through. So when we want to read the voltage from B0, B1, and B2, we really only can do one at a time. We connect the, the MUX from B0 to a capacitor, um, then we read that voltage, then we switch to B1, and then we switch to B2. So we can read them sequentially. Actually, I think it can even get more complicated than that. Each one can have its own um, capacitor, so we can sample them all simultaneously, but then we still have to convert, can do the conversion one at a time. So. Uh, first, we set the MUX to sample a specific pin. Then we close a switch called the sample and hold switch. What that does is it allows the voltage from the B pin to transfer onto a capacitor. So for instance, if there's one volt at that pin uh, and initially zero volts on this capacitor, when you close that switch, the one volt will charge this capacitor to whatever voltage the B pin is. But if the B-pin voltage keeps changing and we don't want to see that change when we try to do our conversion, we will then open that switch back up so that the one volt from the moment we wanted to read it is transferred onto the capacitor, stays on the capacitor, doesn't get further affected by what B0 is now doing. We we'll close the convert switch and the ADC takes that voltage and converts it to a 10-bit number and stores it into a buffer. Then we can uh, use the MUX to set the switch to be touching B1, close the switch, charge the capacitor, open the switch, close the convert switch, out pops a 10-bit number. The um, ADC has its own clock based on the peripheral bus clock. Uh, 
So the rate at which all this happens depends on whatever we set that clock to be. The SAR is the type of ADC on this pick. There are a couple of different types of uh, ADCs out there. The way a SAR works is it has a comparator built in. So the voltage from our capacitor is applied to one pin. And then the pick actually has a DAC internally, and it's a 10-bit DAC. And it does a binary search by applying a voltage to the comparator, comparing that voltage to the voltage from the pin, and then spitting out a one or a zero. Um, so let's say, for instance, this is uh, two volts. The DAC will first generate 1.65 volts, half the range of zero to 3.3. Um, the voltage is bigger, so it will spit out a one. So then the pick will generate, instead of 1.65, it'll go halfway between 1.65 and 3.3. It'll compare that to two volts, and then it'll spit out a one or a zero. Let's say it spits out a zero. Then it will go from that voltage halfway down between that and 1.65, generate that voltage compared to two. Maybe that's bigger again. And it will keep making halfway steps. So initial guess was halfway, and then the uh, out of the total, guess halfway, and then guess halfway, and then guess halfway, and then guess halfway, until after 10 steps, it's finally settled on the closest possible voltage. And the ones and zeros that came out of that comparator are stored into the buffer as our 10-bit number. So that should take 10 ADC clock cycles, plus the amount of time that we closed our sample and hold switch is the total amount of time it takes to read a voltage um, into the pick as a 10-bit number. Now, of course, there's lots of other interesting ways to run the ADC. Um, we can set the timer, a timer to generate all of these clock pulses. We can have this uh, cycle through automatically and store the data into buffers, and then we never have to call a function that ever reads these. We just initialize uh, the timers and the ADC and all happens in the background. Let's look at some sample code, though, that um, shows us the, the really most basic way to do this, which is manually telling the switch to close to sample and manually closing the switch to do the conversion. So here's our sample code from chapter 10. In main, um, the first thing we do is we have to say which pins are capable of being read as analog pins because all the pins by default are digital inputs. So we use the AD1 PCFG bits to select, in this case, pin B14 and B15 as being capable of reading uh, analog. We set up the ADCS bits, which are related to the ADC clock. And then we turn the analog to digital converter on. So this is the most simple way we could do it. There's lots and lots of uh, SFRs associated with the ADC and basically we're leaving them all at the default values. We get into our infinite loop and we call our function ADC sample convert and we send it which pin we're trying to read. And in this case, we set the core timer to zero and then read the core timer after reading two of these values. We print back the voltages and how long it took uh, just to see how long does it take the analog digital converter to run. So the interesting part is the ADC sample convert function takes in the number of the pin we're trying to read, uh, sets the mux to that pin. When we set the sample bit to one that says close the switch that starts charging our capacitor. We do a manual delay here using the core timer, but without setting the core timer to zero. Um, after that amount of time, we uh, disconnect the sample and hold switch. That triggers the conversion to occur. We wait until that conversion is done. The number is stored in, in the buffer, so we return that number. Um, if by chance you're reading the same voltage over and over again and you see that the number is uh, changing, like there is noise on it, that could be because you're not closing the switch long enough. So the sample time can be adjusted um, to either uh, read things faster, but possibly with more noise um, because the capacitor doesn't have enough time to charge. Or you can make this number bigger to get a steadier voltage value. I've actually played around with this and um, depending on the signal you're trying to read, the impedance of the source and the impedance of the pick, determines the noise level, so it's kind of complicated, but these are the, that's the number you play with to try to get the, the numbers to be more stable. So I was playing around with um, the homework, and it asked you to change this sample code from being uh, manual sampling and manual conversion to an automatic version. Uh, it's not super clear how to do that. Um, if you're not very familiar with reading the data sheet and everything. So I went through the process of doing it. And so let's look at the sample code. 
The interesting thing is that the function sample convert, because we switched to an automatic mode, is a lot more simple. We select the MUX pin we're trying to read from. We start sampling. The uh, amount of time has been set up in the initialization, so uh, we don't have to set that SAMP goes back to zero automatically after a certain amount of time. Um, we wait until the conversion is done and we return the number. So because things are happening more automatically, um, we only have to call this function and there's no delays or anything. The timing's all been set up. That means that our initialization is a little more complicated. So we still have to set the pin that we're trying to read from. In this case, I'm only reading from one pin. Um, after I, I've set up all everything else, I turn the ADC on. That's the similar to before. Now I need to set the SSRC bits to do the automatic conversion process. Um, before we were doing manual, so we left the default value. Um, I'm also going to set this whole sampling process to be manual still. I'm still calling a function to force the ADC to occur. Uh, I could have this happen automatically, basically saying, uh, as soon as it's done sampling, just go and sample again and keep sampling as fast as it can, always putting the newest value into buffer. And then I never even have to call my function ADC sample convert. I just read the value out of the buffer. It might not be the, you know, it didn't get triggered to read at that exact moment, but it's happening so fast in the background that it doesn't really matter. But in this case, we're still doing manual. So then we have to set our uh, ADC clock up, and then the SAMC bit here sets how long the uh, switch is closed. And by playing around with this number, you can try to reduce the amount of noise, but also slow down your sampling rate. So this is the way you can do some um, automatic sampling and conversion. What I did here was I took a sine wave from my N-scope going from zero to one volt, and I plugged it into my B15 pin, and I tried to read it a thousand times a second um, for a thousand data points, so one second of data, store it inside the pick, and then print it to my computer so I could see what the noise level was and just what the voltages look like in general. I don't want the pick to always be reading, so I have it wait here uh, until it sees a new line from the computer. And if the letter that it received was the letter A, that triggers it to read a thousand times. Um, so a thousand times, I'm gonna set the core timer to zero, do my read, and then wait for one millisecond to have passed so that I get exactly one millisecond amount of time in between reads. This is a, a way of kind of doing it without a timer-based interrupt, but I could have used an interrupt if I if had other stuff to do here. After collecting a thousand things into my array A, then I go into a, a for loop where I print them back one at a time. So I've already loaded that onto my pick. Let me see what that looks like. min gw32 dash make, and I'll go into putty. And putty's not showing anything because the pick will not send anything back until I send the letter A. So I'll type the letter A and hit enter. The pick for one second collected a thousand data points and then it printed them all back. I guess there's a thousand numbers in there. Uh, the sine wave's going from zero volts to, to one volt uh, on the ADC. That should be from zero to around 300. So I see a maximum value in here of something like uh, 315 and a minimum in 10. So I don't know, it kind of looks like there's a sine wave, but I don't get to plot it because the data is still in putty, it still is text. So this introduces us to the next thing we need to be able to do on the pick is once we collect all this data, we want to send it back and plot it. Uh, let's use Python to do that. So here's uh, some Python code that's going to open my serial port, send the letter A, and then read back a thousand values and plot them for me. We'll start to introduce some more Python code as we go um, because uh, in the next few projects we do, we'll be collecting data, sending it back to plot. You could do this in MATLAB and the book suggests to do it in MATLAB, but these days Python's a little bit better. So how do we do Python? Uh, we're saving this file as a .py, that's a Python file. Um, our library rather than pound include is import, so I'm importing the serial library. I'm opening my serial port. Here's the name of my serial port. This is the baud rate, and I'm using hardware flow control. Um, then I'm printing to my screen uh, which serial port I open just to do a sanity check. Now the pick is waiting for me to send the letter A. So I write the letter A and a new line. That triggers the pick to collect a thousand data points at a kilohertz, so one second of data. Then the data, then the pick starts sending the data back. So I set up uh, a list to save the data into, and the number, uh, the essentially the index, how many data points I received. So while I have not yet received a thousand data points, I will read the text that comes back 
from the pick into um, this variable. And those are state, this is kind of like a character array. So um, each letter is saved as a byte in this list data read. I'm gonna convert that into a string. So now I have uh, the data as a string of letters. Then I can use the int function to turn my string into an integer. And then I will save that into an array because sometimes I might send number space a number or something. So in this case, there's only one, but in the future, we'll do something more complicated. So um, this is a line that just eventually turns the data into numbers. And as long as I got one number, I will save it into uh, my list uh, ADC val by appending it to the end. I'll remember that I got one piece of data and I'll do that a thousand times. So when this is done, the pick has now sent all of the data over and I've put it into a list called ADC val. Now I'm going to uh, import my plotting library called matplotlib. And here I'm going to do something even more fancy. I'm going to uh, import my uh, math library called numpy and I'm going to do an FFT of this data to verify the 25 hertz signal that the n scope generated is 25 hertz because I know my sample rate is kilohertz. So my sample rate is a kilohertz and this is code that generates an FFT. We can talk about that if you're interested, but it's not particularly necessary to know right now. And then I do the plot. And then when I'm done, I have to close the serial port. So let's see what that looks like. To run Python, I type, uh, in my computer, I installed Anaconda, so I type pi. If you've installed Python from scratch, you probably type Python 3. Uh, pi, and uh, I call this ana.py. I'm going to run that. So I opened my serial port, sent the letter A, it waited one second to get all the data back, it collected all the data, then it plots it. At the top of this plot, I'm showing the raw data. So we get to see the sine wave. I see one second of data. There should be, um, okay, we see the raw data points up here um, and a line that connects them. It's not a perfect sine wave. There's a little bit of noise on top. How do we know there's noise? Well, we take an FFT. So the FFT says, uh, what is the magnitude of every frequency in here from zero to the Nyquist frequency, which is half of our sample rate. Um, this is a uh, log linear plot. This is a, uh, Oh, a linear linear plot. This is linear log plot. And I can see that at 25 hertz, I've got a big spike because that's the main source of uh, sine wave here. And the base level noise here doesn't show any particular frequency also being noise other than the mean. The mean is because this signal does not have a mean of zero. So the DC offset is um, it's like about 150. And that seems to match up here is the mean like 150. Because I didn't convert this to voltage, I sent the raw data back. So that's the long explanation of how the analog to digital converter works and how to read the data back into Python to plot it. We'll be playing around with that as we explore our first project in chapter 24.